People who work for airlines. What are secrets that passengers don't know? Story 1. I've been with an airline for the better part of three years now, and there are definitely a few great things to keep in mind anytime you take a commercial flight. Starting from the minute you get into the airport, customer service agents are the first people that can make or break your trip. Yelling, screaming, getting crabby, lewd, patronizing only makes your trip worse and worse. You see, when you think you're making a point or a difference in these people's lives, you're totally wrong. They retreat to the break room and laugh about it with their coworkers. And they probably didn't go out of their way to get you a better seat. Golden rule, be nice. Simple, smile, joke around, keep a positive disposition. This seems impossible when shit's hitting the fan in the case of cancellations or delays. But believe me, those agents didn't want those things to happen either. They can and will work their magic if you give them the opportunity to do it. There are ways to get you a window or aisle seat even if there are only middle seats showing. Believe me, a coffee goes a very long way at the gate as well if you're traveling with an airline that's known to upgrade. Once you're on board, those flight attendants are not only gorgeous, funny, and smart, but they're also highly trained professionals that can and will put their own lives at risk for a perfect stranger should the situation arise. Not many people appreciate that fact. So again, be nice. Someone else on this topic I've talked to also noticed one of the trade secrets, chocolates. I flew with an airline transatlantic in August, an economy. I approached the lead flight attendant, the one that greets you as you board, and introduced myself and thanked them for having me on board, exchanged pleasantries, and handed him a mini four-pack of maple syrup. Can you guess which country I was leaving from? Sat down for about five minutes in my coach seat before he came by and said he was sorry, but my seat assignment was unfortunately changed. I spent the next seven hours in a lay flat bed with all the gray goose I could handle. Now, this grant was a standby flight, but regular travelers can also get this treatment. I've seen it. In the flight deck, this place is just hilarious. I have flown in the jump seat on a handful of occasions, and I never pass up the opportunity. Between the gadgets, knobs, dials, and especially the view, this is the one place that would cure every nervous flight. Everything that goes into making a plane and keeping it in the air is mind-boggling, and the two pilots up front know exactly what they're doing. It's like a work of art, seeing them bring this thing up and down. But that's where it ends. Under 10,000 feet is where the magic happens. Above 10,000 feet, it's a lot of banter involving ex-wives, summer houses, bill payments, and catching up on two to three day old newspapers that have probably been read nine or ten times. One time, the sun was shining into my eyes in the jump seat, and they took out their stack of safety cards and covered the entire windshield, kicked their feet up, and enjoyed the ride. When I jokingly blurted out, you can't see the road. They pointed to the instruments and just said, it's right there. As the old airline adage goes, what separates from alcoholics. The cockpit door. Story 2. Women. If you pack a toy in your bag, take the batteries out. Because if I'm loading your bag and I hear it vibrating, I have to tell my lead. Then my lead has to come pull you off the aircraft and you have to open your bag and turn off your toy in front of a bunch of giggling grown men. It used to be that you had to open the bag in the presence of the passenger, at least for the regional airline I worked for. The first time it happened to me, I was a bit titillated, having heard stories from my co-workers. I got the name off of the bag tag, went into the gate area, and found her, a very large woman in her mid-fifties, by my guess. Her face paled when I quietly explained that her bag was vibrating and that I would have to open it to resolve any security concerns, and would she please accompany me to the ramp area to witness. She asked if she could just open the bag herself and take care of it, and I had to inform her that, no, she was not allowed to touch her bag until she reached her final destination. She reluctantly agreed and followed me outside. I opened her bag. She was in front of the wing. I was behind it in view of her, and lifted the top layer of clothes to find the most elaborate d***o my young eyes have ever beheld. The kind with little extra arms for animal or stimulation. I was able to maintain my professionalism long enough to remove the batteries, verify that the vibration had ceased, close the bag, and thank the lady, but my asshole brain tormented me with a richly detailed mental picture of that passenger going to town on that
So, for weeks afterward. The few times I had a vibrating bag after that, I silently prayed for an electric toothbrush. Story 3. When you experience a hard landing in bad weather, it wasn't because of a lack of pilot skills, but it is in fact intentional. If the runway is covered in water, the airplane has to touch down hard in order to puncture the water layer and prevent aquaplaning. Mobile electronic devices won't really bring an airplane down, but they can really be annoying to pilots. Just imagine sitting in the flight deck, descending to your destination, and hearing the interference of 100 plus cell phones picking up a signal. I have missed a clearance or two that way. The air you breathe on an airplane is actually compressed air taken from the engines. A large portion, 25 to 50 percent, is blown in the flight deck. The rest is for the passengers. The air leaves the airplane via a small hole in the back of the fuselage. The captain has almost limitless authority when the doors are closed. He is allowed to arrest people, write fines, and even take the will of a passenger. At most airlines, the only difference between the captain and the co-pilot is the rank. They divide the workload fairly and switch the roles of pilot flying and pilot non-flying each flight. Story 4. I was a ramp agent for Delta. A lot of freight gets shipped on commercial flights. One of these items was always called HR on the radios. HR was an abbreviation for human remains. Some people die far away from where they want to get buried. They're packed in wood-framed boxes, so you would never know what was inside except by the strange shape of them. They were a to handle. People weigh a bit. Add a casket and shipping container and you're looking at anywhere from 250 to 400 pounds. Also, the bin doors tend to be pretty narrow. Wrestling these things out of the plane was always a giant pain in the ass. HR in the middle bin of a mad dog, MD-90, fuck that. TLDR. If you hear about an HR while flying Delta, it means there's a dead body in cargo. But what if the plane went down? Sir, there are 92 people on board when the plane took off, but there were 93 bodies. It was a wrist. Then they proceed to shut down every airport within 6,000 miles. Story 5. Some airlines don't pay pilots or flight attendants for flights that cancel, which doesn't sound so bad until you start thinking about the safety implications of it. A little short on the rent this month? Then I don't see that hydraulic leak. I can't afford to have the flight canceled. Child need to see the doctor? Maybe I don't report the torn up carpet that you might trip on in an evacuation because carpet takes too long to replace, so the flight would cancel. Not saying this happens all the time because most crews are true professionals and can put their job ahead of their paycheck. But it does happen enough to give you goosebumps. Throw in some seriously low pay, sub 20000 a year for many first year pilots, and you've got a subtle incentive to overlook safety issues. Story 6. I have a friend who's a commercial pilot. Around five years ago, he was doing a flight from LA to Tokyo when an anonymous caller phoned in a threat while they were over the middle of the Pacific. Apparently, they have procedures for this kind of thing, but there was nothing anyone could do in this situation except stay calm and not alert the passengers, obviously. He said for the rest of the flight, every bump of turbulence made his adrenaline spike. They took this case especially seriously because there was a group of foreign dignitaries sitting in the first class cabin. In situations like this, they radio back and everyone on board gets their name cross-checked for links to and prior convictions. It comes back as a high level, medium, or no threat. Story 7. Passenger weighing in. If you have a musical instrument, never check it. Take it to the gate with you. If they don't have room on the plane, they can gate check it and put it on last. When you deboard on your next stop, it will be waiting for you as soon as you exit the plane. A note. I've heard from baggage handlers and flight attendants that they do not appreciate musicians doing this. As I already said, if there isn't room on the plane, then I'll gate check it. This ensures that it goes on last and is taken off first, then left at the ramp for you to pick up immediately after deboarding the plane. I'm sorry if this is an inconvenience for people in the industry, but all my f**ks were given when I lost my deployment gift to careless handlers and was not refunded the total amount to get a new one. You can move your f**k over in the closet so I can protect my $1,500 baby. P.S. I have never had a bad experience doing this. Every flight attendant I've done this with has been more than accommodating. Story 8. Aluminum, unlike steel, doesn't have a lower stress limit for fatigue cracking. In layman's terms, this means that whenever you apply load to it, it cracks. Planes are designed so that under normal loads, the cracks are microscopic, but they will always be there and they grow with repeated stress cycles, i.e. every time the plane is flown, the cracks grow. Maintenance crews 
are responsible for knowing where they are on each individual plane and tracking their growth. Source is my mechanical engineering professor from my college days. Story 9. Will probably get buried that I am an aircraft fueler. One thing I cannot stress enough is how your pets are treated. While your airline will take the best possible actions, some things cannot be avoided, like the noise on the ramp. I cannot stand out there without ear protection, and imagine your pet sitting out there on the ramp waiting to be loaded onto the plane being exposed to the same amount of noise I am. Please, people, think twice before flying your pets. I'll add some facts. I've heard from someone in the domain. Flying with pets is sometimes unavoidable. I am in no way saying that that flying your pet makes you a shitty owner. Just bear in mind the conditions that they will be experiencing. They might need some extra cuddles when they get back. A lot of baggage handlers I have seen are really good about pets, but not everything. The people that are moving your pets onto the plane are not very well paid, at least what they deserve. Every airline is different. Check with your airline and see what their pet policy is, and ask about any VIP or in-cabin options. While not the best, it may be more comfortable for your pet. The people who I have seen that look after your pet before they are loaded onto the plane are really great guys and love what they do. Again, results may vary from airport to airport. Story 10. On some 747s, Air France and possibly others, the upper deck economy class seats have a little extra room and storage on the window seats. They have a tiny bit more legroom too. Air France used to block these off for picking seats ahead of time unless you have a higher tier card. If you check in a bit early, you can get them. It's probably been mentioned, but SeatGuru.com is the resource for checking seats for whatever steel you're flying on. Story 11. I am a commercial aircraft fueler. At my airport, we get a lot of small jets. CRJ-200, 700, 900, ERJ-145, 737s, MD-88, 95, DC-9. One of the main things as a fueler is having to overwing a plane. We do that when the single point on the plane is an op and have to pump 600 to 1,000 gallons of jet into the plane. This is when you see us, one on each side, take a small fuel pump, usually the ones you put in your car, and balance out the fuel on each side. It's a long process, usually two gallons a second. Fueling is labor intensive, but nowhere near as bad as the ramp agents. I also was a ramp agent for United, and most any ramp agents will tell you, do not buy expensive luggage. When your bag weighs 30 to 40 pounds and I have 50 to 100 bags coming to me at once, I can't treat yours with the love and care that you would like. They usually want small jets out in 20 minutes. This includes scanning bags, down loading, dropping off, scanning new bags for departure, and loading and pushing back. Another tidbit, if you are pushed back and sitting there, it's because either your wheels got pushed back or you're delayed. Pilots do not get paid when brakes are set. They get paid pilot pay when the brakes are released. You can only be pushed away and sit there waiting to leave for two hours. After that, you return to the gate and this way you can take care of business. Your flight will get delayed or canceled if your coffee pot is broken or an op. Planes break. It sucks, but respect it. The air Airlines care very much about safety. They will ground your plane for the smallest issue. I have seen a plane canceled because the lave was clogged. But at the end of the day, you should be thankful. Story 12. Flight attendant. Pilots do not fix the plane. They fly it. If it's major, they call maintenance. Stop asking the pilots to just fix the plane. Sometimes it takes a while. I'm sorry. It sucks. Deal with it. My day is long. So damn long. Please be nice. I see hundreds of people in a day. If I'm abrupt with you in any way, I apologize. I'm trying to, one, expedite the boarding process so we can leave on time. Two, I'm running on very little sleep and I'm cranking. Three, I've dealt with too many assholes and or delays that day, and my spirit is utterly crushed. You'll rarely see me upset, but many other flight attendants are bitches. I'm sorry, they don't love their job like I do. We only get paid when the main cabin door is closed. I make less than 20k a year. This is common. I know that you know how to put on a seatbelt. I still have to do a safety demo. It's a liability issue. Do not treat me like a waitress. I'm not. I get paid less, and my hours are longer, and the job involves much more than serving you a drink and some peanuts. I personally don't care if you use your electronic devices. However, don't be talking on your phone during taxi. If I can't see your phone, I don't care if you're playing Angry Birds. We're not going to crash. Many airlines have changed their rules, but mine has not, and I have to enforce the rules. People vent their frustrations about flying to me. It's hard being 
laughed at, knowing you caused none of the problems. Believe me, it's in our best interest to keep you happy. Why would we want otherwise? The FAA makes the rules, not your flight crew. We are just the crew. Every decision comes from above. Remember that. Be nice. Story 13. Not so much a secret, but something worth knowing about. TSA PreCheck. You get to bypass pretty much everyone. Leave your shoes on, your laptop in your bag, and don't have to take out your small liquid containers. To get TSA PreCheck, Check, you need to be recommended to the TSA by an airline, meaning you need to be a very frequent flyer. Or you can apply for global entry, which makes getting through customs a breeze. It costs $100 to apply and you have to fill out paperwork and go through an interview process. Some credit cards will pay the fee, like American Express Platinum. Addition. Okay, if you are a frequent flyer, you might as well get an American Express Platinum card. It's $450 a year, which sounds expensive, but the previously mentioned $100 global entry fee is waived. You get $200 in airline fee credit. Baggage fees, upgrade points, or a number of any other random fee is automatically deducted. You get into U.S. Airways clubs, Admiral's lounges, Delta lounges. Your immediate family or two guests can come too. You get a free priority pass, which lets you into tons of lounges around the world. You can get a free companion ticket if you buy an international first business class. And though those are just some of the travel perks. This might not appeal to everyone, but I'm sure there are some other frequent flyers out there who wouldn't mind paying $450 for global entry, $200 in airline charges, lounge access, and companion tickets. Another addition, apparently the American Express lounges are now free to platinum and black card members. These lounges have free spas and food. I hear the drinks are free too, but I don't know for sure. There is one in Terminal D of DFW that that just opened and one in the Las Vegas airport. If you have a platinum or black card, you should check them out instead of going to the regular airline lounges. Story 14. I used to be an operations control center manager for a regional airline, about 900 flights a day. Ultimately, I was the guy that decided if your flight was going to be canceled. Most people don't know I exist. When passengers here cancel due to ATC or WX or MX, it's really just a small team of people deciding if your flight is going to make it, and often it's not even your plane or flight that has the problem. In the case of ATC and weather, we will be allowed X number of arrivals an hour. We decide which ones are going and which ones will stay or reposition to another city. Passengers are usually one of the last items of consideration. Safety is always first. We won't send it if there is reason to believe it's unsafe, and if we can blame it on weather, we will. It's much cheaper for the airline if it's blamed on WX, since they don't have as many benefits for the customer, food vouchers, hotels, etc. Next most important is which crews will time out and how critical it is that they get to their next stop. The way crews are routed, we often have to cancel something today to save three flights that would need to be canceled tomorrow if the AC and crew don't get to the right place by the right time. Next is where the AC is routed since they are often carrying MX items that expire at a certain date and can only be fixed in specific bases. After that is car Cargo and bags. Bags cost a lot more to get rerouted than passengers. The reason for this is that passengers can go on the next plane, but if their bags don't make it, we deliver them to you, not the airport that you were going to. Couriers can get expensive quickly, so it's better business to have your bags waiting for you rather than the other way around, even if that means kicking you off the plane and taking your bags. Last is passengers, sometimes based on a priority list of VIPs and sometimes based on doing the most good for the largest number of people. Ultimately, regional airlines only have one customer, the major airline they serve. They are paid based on a number of metrics to summarize their performance and there are tiers for penalty and bonus. The airline knows exactly, to the minute, where they are in relation to these goals, and we will often sacrifice one for the other. Example, if we are near a penalty for on-time departures within zero minutes of scheduled departure time, but have a good cushion on completion factor, we will cancel a flight just to make one go on time. TLDR, I got a D in ethics, but I'm really good at math.